You have probably heard the phrase, cancel culture. What does it mean? Well, according to Wikipedia, cancel culture is a phrase contemporary to the late 2010s and early 2020s used to refer to a cultural phenomenon in which an individual deemed to have acted or spoken in an unacceptable manner is ostracized, boycotted, shunned, fired, or assaulted, often by the aid of social media. On college campuses, which were once uh, designed to be bastions of free speech, people like uh, Riley Gaines have been prevented from speaking and even threatened by those who wanted to cancel her. Talk about zero tolerance. That's what some have in today's world. They're not interested in discussion. They're not interested in debate. They're right and you're wrong and that's it, according to them. How did things in the world get to where they are today? With rampant immorality and wickedness being supported and common sense being shouted down. How did we arrive at the point of loving that which was evil and hating that and despising that which is good and right? There is a one word that answers that question. The Bible warns about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, but it's nothing new. It began in the Garden of Eden. These are the same temptations that Satan used upon Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before Christ and before our era, described today's society in Isaiah 5, 20 through 24, which was just read for us. And again, is it not the case that this very day there are those who call evil good and good evil? And uh, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Do we not have that same kind of society that existed in the time of Isaiah? This is nothing new. It's been going on for hundreds of years. Now, notice some of the things that are mentioned in verses 21 through 23. Uh, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Have you noticed who it is that is saying that evil is good and good evil? They'll get panels of uh, philosophers and experts and line them up on TV shows and they will sit there and say these very things that good is evil and evil is good. Much of it has to do with academia. Uh, much of the upside-down, topsy-turvy values in today's society is being taught in the universities of this land. But they are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Anybody who has been on a college campus in the last 50 years knows that this description is appropriate with at least a great portion of professors. Not to say that all are that way, but there are many who are. And they resent anything Christian. They do not want anybody to proclaim anything of a moral nature. That is not what they all, at all want. They want just the opposite. Woe to those who are mighty in drinking wine, or doing drugs, we might say today, although there's still many who are addicted to wine also. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. 
you know, uh, that's an Olympic sport to them. They're in training for getting drunk. Uh, as much effort as an athlete would put into winning a contest, that's about the way they uh, approach drugs or alcohol. Who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Do we not see that happening frequently in today's society? Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected, rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and they despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Now, that is clearly where many of the pundits and experts are in America today. The only thing that makes it worse in Isaiah's day is that this was God's people. This was God's people who were doing this. We are not, by and large, God's people. We are a country founded on biblical principles, but we do not have the relationship to God that Israel had with God, and even they can be described this way, how shameful that God's own people should be in this kind of situation. So prophet, the prophet Isaiah described precisely, though, what we're seeing today and probably which future generations shall witness and observe also. There are those who are trying to silence God's word. The wicked seek to destroy and silence the word of God because it not only exposes them, it condemns them. Consider again John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than the light, lest, uh, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Now what's one of the favorite verses that people like to cite from the scriptures? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's too bad many people stop at verse 16 and don't read the two that we just read in verses 19 and 20. People like the good stuff. Oh, believe. Oh, faith. That's wonderful. We're all for that. And yet some of those same people put darkness for light and light for darkness and are exactly as Jesus described in verses 19 and 20, just three verses away from their beloved John 3.16. People are inconsistent. They seek to destroy the good. Anything that would be a threat to the immorality that we want to cling to, they are hostile toward and desire to cancel. Ignoring and understanding, uh, and undermining rather, the everlasting word of the Almighty will not make evil less evil. They are so captivated by their sins, so much in love with them, that they cannot imagine that their profane and corrupt behavior will bring upon them everlasting punishment. But of course, it will. They live in self-denial. Saints of the Lord would love to help some of these people out. 
that we would love to bring them out of the colossal mess that they have made of their lives, but they will have none of it. They are not interested in improvement. They are comfortable with the mess that they're living in. They have become so depraved, they actually think that the righteous are the problem instead of righteousness being the solution. So there is the desire to cancel the word of God. Now this goes back to the days of the apostles. The apostles were supposedly canceled by the chief priests in Jerusalem by putting them into prison. Let's go ahead and read that from uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Why? The apostles robbed a bank? What were they doing that was so incensed the high priest? They healed a man. They did good to a man who was in need of healing. And they are bothered by that. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a common prison. So they thought they had canceled them. But... At night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And uh, so the next morning, the Sadducees, they were all stunned because the prisoners were gone. We thought we'd canceled them. Well, an angel of the Lord canceled you in this case because he has greater power than men did. But it didn't slow them down. They brought them in and threatened them again in uh, Acts chapter 5 and uh, verse 28, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Well, the apostles apologize? No. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. They were not intimidated. They were not going to be canceled. They were going to continue to preach and teach the word of God. A little bit later, a mob destroyed, stoned to death, Stephen. Stephen had taught the words of the Lord in faith and in power. His opposition, in fact, were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. In other words, he spoke words of truth. He spoke words which they knew were true if they knew their own history. And he did it in a way that was uh, beyond reproach. So he spoke with wisdom and in a proper manner and a attitude. But they still didn't want to hear it because it wasn't the message they were interested in. So they cast him out of the city. And we read about this in chapter 7, beginning with about verse 51. Stephen said, you stiff-necked, and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers 
and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and asking, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. They managed to silence Stephen's voice that hour, but his words continue to be spoken. We just spoke them because they were written down and recorded. God did not let his words perish. Yes, sometimes his people are put to death, but the word continues. The word cannot be canceled. As a young man, Saul stood by as they stoned Stephen to death. Saul became, however, a staunch supporter of the canceling. Not only of the voice of Christians, he also wanted to cancel Christians themselves. And he was desperately seeking to silence the word of the Lord. Notice chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. And as a result of all these things, a great persecution arose against the church. And people, Christians, were scattered all over. Verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. However, the canceler becomes a cancelee. The resurrected Jesus appeared to him, and that visit shook Saul to the core. He repented of his sins. When Ananias came to him, he had been repenting and praying for three days, but he was not yet saved. He was not saved on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him. He was not saved as a result of praying for three days. How do we know that? Because of Acts 22, 16. Ananias said to him, and now Saul, why do you wait? And notice these words carefully. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of of the Lord. This is the way one calls on God's name, by not only repenting, but being baptized to have sins washed away. Saul spent the rest of his life promoting Christianity, which he once zealously persecuted but now he would be the recipient of the persecution. Paul, as he became called, Paul paid a tremendous price for standing for the truth. He was persecuted relentlessly. He was stoned and left for dead in Acts chapter 14. He was beaten and imprisoned in Acts chapter 16. He was thrown out of the city in Acts chapter 17. He was continually the target of cancellation. Let's take a look at Psalm 50 and verse 17. 
Psalm 50 and verse 17. Because we find something similar in older times. In Psalm chapter 50 and verse 17, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind your back. Now, the psalmist is writing that this is the way that some of the people of his age were. They took the words of God and cast them behind their back. Why? They didn't want to hear them. They were just like what Jesus described in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, that we talked about a little bit ago. Let's take a look at Nehemiah chapter 9. And uh, verse 26. Now this takes place after Israel has been transported to Babylon and has been released. And they have come back and built the temple and the wall around the city. But notice what Nehemiah says as he is recounting some things in their history. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself. And they worked great provocations. Yes, that's why they were taken captive. That's why God allowed his people to be taken prisoner to another nation. But truth cannot be silenced. Men can take it and cast it behind their backs and ignore it, but it doesn't go away. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, beginning with verse 23. And it happened... When Jehudi had read three or four columns, now this is written on a scroll and given to the king of Israel by Jeremiah the prophet. But anyway, after he had read three or four columns, that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Jehoiakim said, I'm going to cancel this word. I'm going to obliterate it. I'm not only going to cut it up, I'm going to throw it into the fire. And that'll be the end of that. He slightly miscalculated. For we read in, in uh, Jeremiah Chapter 36, verse 32. Then Je Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. Well, what do you know? Those words are not gone, those words are not lost, they were rewritten. And besides, there were added to them many similar words. You cannot get rid of the word of God. Truth cannot be canceled. As Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So how are you doing at living the Word of God? Are there portions of it that you don't like that you would just like to cast behind your back? Or are you willing to accept all that it teaches? Oh, uh, well, you know, there are some things that are pretty hard to do. Yeah, probably so. It's pretty hard to repent, isn't it? Because we have a fondness for sin, and we don't want to give it up 
or let it go. Maybe we've been taught certain things in our lives that we don't want to let go of that either, even though it's wrong. For example, what about Mark 16 and verse 16? Oh, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You know, I, I've heard that verse, but I've always been told that you don't need to be baptized. I'll read the verse again. He who believes and, and, and is baptized shall be saved. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I've still been taught otherwise. Read it again. It's going to say the same thing every time you read it. Isn't that amazing? It's not going to read differently the next time. It's always going to say the same thing, isn't it? Somebody told you baptism was not necessary, but it wasn't Jesus, was it? Jesus said it was necessary. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Well, uh, what about Luke chapter 13 and verse 3? Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Well, do I have to repent of everything? Yeah, pretty much. What are you going to leave out? What are you not going to repent of? And if it's a sin, why aren't you willing to repent of it? Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Sin has to be defined by God. He's the only one who can give an adequate definition. He's the only one who can distinguish between light and darkness because Men get confused. They put light for darkness and darkness for light. There's only one source of truth, and that is God and the word that he gave to us so that we would know what is the truth. Yes, we have to repent of all sins. And isn't it interesting that Acts 2.38 combines those two things. He who repents and is baptized shall be saved. Yeah, but I've still been taught otherwise. Well, did you ever consider the person who taught you otherwise was wrong? Have you considered that he disagrees with what the scriptures say? You know, you have to consider that. Both are required. So, are you going to try to cancel the scriptures as a whole? Are you going to try to silence the scriptures in part, the part you may not agree with? Or are you going to listen to Jesus who said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, not those who are proud, but those who listen. The poor in spirit, they're humble, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Hebrews chapter 5. And verse 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them who obey him. We can't stop at John 3.16 because it sounds appealing. It's true. It's right so far as it goes. And a person who has faith will repent of his sins and will be baptized. But just to cut off and lop it off and uh, put it on a plaque and say, I don't need to be obedient, is to mishandle the word of God. And whether intended or not is an effort to cancel or silence the word of God. Where do you stand this morning? Can we help you come back to Christ? Can we help you to restore the love you once had? Can we help you uh, instill in you a desire to know, read, and understand the Word of God? Let us know. We'll be glad to help you repent. Or, if you have not repented and been baptized, please let's study that further so that you can be persuaded it's what you need to do. But if you're ready, come now. Can we help you in any of these things? Jesus canceled your debt. You can't cancel him. 
but he canceled your debt. Come and take advantage of the gracious offer of salvation that he gives. While we stand and while we sing. <laughs>